This episode of Cell and Gene, the podcast, is brought to you in partnership with Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thermo Fisher's cell therapy processing instruments are designed to help customers transition from process development to commercial manufacturing, utilized as standalone devices or integrated as part of a closed modular process. Thermo Fisher Scientific recommends Gibco CTS DynaSelect Magnetic Separation System, which is a next gen cell isolation and activation instrument. Gibco CTS Xenon Electroporation System allows customers full control to optimize for a variety of cell types and payloads. And Gibco CTS Rotea Counterflow Centrifugation System is a closed cell processing system supporting a broad range of protocols for cell separation, washing, and concentration. Customers can rely on and streamline their drug development process with Applied Biosystems Qualtrack qPCR and dPCR quality control tools for robust and reliable genetic analysis across various phases of drug development, supported by relevant, compliant documentation. listeners and welcome to this episode of Cell and Gene the podcast. I'm your host Erin Harris and my very special guest for this episode needs no introduction but I shall do my best to introduce him to you anyway, Dr. Peter Marks. If you plan to google Dr. Marks be sure to set aside some time. His CV is both impressive and extensive. Dr. Marks is a hematologist oncologist by training and he is serving as the director of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research within the Food and Drug Administration. He joined the FDA in 2012 as Deputy Center Director for CBER and became Center Director in 2016. Welcome to Cell and Gene, the podcast, Dr. Marks. It is my sincere pleasure to have you as my guest. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. So let's jump right into our question set. So you joined the FDA in 2012, like we said, as Deputy Center Director for CBER and became Center Director in 2016. So specifically regarding cell and gene therapies, what has changed most during your tenure? Yeah, well, I think most obviously is when I came to the center, um, chimeric antigen receptor T cells were uh, really in their uh, heyday of development, but there was nothing approved in the way uh, of a genetically modified cell therapy. Uh, and there was not a gene therapy approved. Um, uh, then we started to have a run of uh, approvals that started uh, mid-decade. And uh, uh, we, at this point, um, have uh, 11 approved cell uh, 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 or genetically modified cell or uh, uh, directly administered gene therapy. So um, uh, really a change from going from a time of potential uh, when things were in development to uh, a time of reality. Um, uh, and uh, right now, I think we're sitting on a, a large growth curve. Um, uh, uh, so a real transition. Good. I'm glad you mentioned that growth curve because that's what I wanted to talk about next. What would you like to see improve in w not only within CBER in the next few years, but just in general within the sector in terms of growth? So I think there are things that we can do at FDA and there are things that the sector can do. The things that we can do at FDA, I think, um, is to staff up in order to provide uh, the uh, feedback to sponsors, particularly early on, that they really need in order to get off to a good start on their development programs. Um, and although I think we give very good feedback, it has not always been as timely as at least I would like to see it be. Um, uh, and uh, that's because of resource limitations and also because of what intervened with the COVID-19 pandemic. But um, thanks to uh, the user fee reauthorizations, we are staffing up uh, in uh, those who uh, work on cell and gene therapy in the agency by a significant number uh, of, of individuals. Uh, and as those people come on board, I think we'll be able to get back that feedback uh, more rapidly. From the standpoint of industry, um, and product developers, I think um, this is a field where um, more so than in the small molecule development world where any one small molecule's chance of success was never all that great. Um, uh, here, um, uh, people need to plan for the possibility of success, which means that from the beginning, they need to 
figure out how they are going to manufacture and characterize their products. Uh, and hopefully that will improve over the coming years because I think as we see um, products coming along um, uh, that we don't want to see them hindered uh, by problems uh, with manufacture uh, that might limit their ability to make it uh, to the benefit of patients. Yeah, sure. That makes a lot of sense. And um, I do want to talk a little bit about, you mentioned staffing at CBER and, and what came out of the entire, you know, most likely PDUFA 7. Um, and due to the pandemic, you know, CBER, of course, had to shift its focus to vaccines needed to, to combat COVID-19, obviously. Um, there were a few key provisions of PDUFA 7, and one of them is a budget and staffing increase for CBER. So, the increase is obviously designed to develop its capacity for regulating cell and gene therapies. So talk us through a little bit about what measures have you put in place to one, ensure this will be done. And then what does that actually mean for sponsor companies and biotechs? Um, you know, what, what will they, what should they expect to see as a result of these provisions? Yeah. So the, the, Provisions give us about 125 uh, new staff members to handle cell and gene therapies. Um, uh, and uh, 100, about 100 of those will go directly to the, uh, to the cell and gene therapy uh, office. And the remainder will be going to support offices, those who help uh, do the, the biostatistics that need to be done um, and the inspections uh, and the support work. Um, the important thing to understand is while we're doing this, this you can see with that many new people coming on board, in addition to those already on board, we recognized that we needed to uh, probably uh, get things organized a little bit differently. And because of that, we've undertaken a reorganization where uh, what is currently our Office of Tissues and Advanced Therapies is becoming a structure called a super office. Uh, it's uh, essentially are going to uh, become the Office of Therapeutic Products. That super office will have uh, uh, six different uh, other offices, sub offices under it, um, which will uh, allow it um, to cover cell therapy, gene therapy, and uh, other therapeutics in a more uh, comprehensive manner in each of the offices. Um, and so I think that will be helpful because it will be, it will, industry will know who's focusing on what. Um, uh, and over that now, um, uh, as the, we will have an, an, uh, an acting head of this area um, who will uh, help ensure uh, that uh, we bring on uh, the resources that we need. Um, and we will have a bit of a hiring frenzy um, uh, as, we, as we come into the new year, as we staff up um, uh, all of these different offices. So um, yeah, you can expect to see us um, uh, advertising in journals, um, on websites, um, uh, and through word of mouth to try to uh, staff up here. Uh, and we'll also use uh, search firms, et, et cetera. We, we will use all of the tools <laughs> uh, and techniques that we can to try to get uh, staffed up as quickly as possible. Yeah, sure, to hire the right individuals. That's fantastic. And I love the term super office. I don't think I've heard that before. That's really exciting. And I'm, I'm happy not only for you and your team, but also for the companies who are going to be the recipients of all that good work. Um, I want to talk a little bit about there was obviously life before the pandemic and life now. So what learnings would you say that the pandemic granted to you and your team that you might be able to apply to cell and gene therapies going forward? Yeah, so, um, you know, our center was uh, very much involved in some of the critical pandemic products um, uh, moving along, including vaccines. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the, the kind of the deep learnings that came from that um, uh, was that uh, the communication process is really so critical to expediting development. And so, what I would see and what I'd like to see coming out of this pandemic is uh, as us exploring ways of increasing uh, communication uh, on, a, uh, on a more 
informal type of uh, meeting basis than we have done in the past. So we have obviously formal meetings, type A, B, C uh, meetings that we have with companies, but those have uh, lengthy timelines. They require very formal packages. And I think, you know, for uh, products that are uh, being developed to meet the needs of small uh, populations, um, uh, particularly of people with serious illnesses that are being developed by small companies, waiting two, three, four months to get responses um, really does slow down the process um, uh, in multiple ways because it also burns cash for these companies, um, delays getting uh, uh, things to patients in need. And so if we can find a way to um, have more informal uh, conversations during development, I think that might be very helpful. That certainly worked um, as something that helped facilitate development uh, of the vaccines uh, and certain other medical products during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so you, you might see us try something like some pilots uh, where we um, uh, will uh, take products that already seem to have some promise and, and see if we uh, uh, if, the, if those uh, uh, developers are interested in participating in pilot programs uh, where we uh, allow for an increased level of communication on an informal basis to see if that actually makes a difference. We'd obviously be measuring what we were doing uh, in order to uh, see if uh, it, giving this additional communication actually uh, brought uh, uh, perceived and or real benefit uh, to uh, the product development process. Good, yeah, and, and obviously communication being a critical component of any uh, successful endeavor, but you know sometimes you do have to pay specific attention to it to ensure that it's being done properly and formally or informally. So that's really good news. Um, speaking of development, I wanted to talk a little bit about innovations in what you see coming down the pike in clinical development. So what would you say are maybe the, the top areas of innovation in the next three years, whether it be in gene editing, cell-based gene therapies? Um, what do you see, without being a futurist, what do you see in the top areas of innovation? Yeah, I think I think there are, I'll, let me pick two, one, one more on the cell side, one on, on, the, gene, on the gene therapy side. Um, uh, 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 on, the, on the more pure directly administered gene, gene therapy side. So I, I think on the cell, the, the, the cell-based side or the genetically modified cell-based side, I think the, 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 the development into a reality of allogeneic uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells um, is probably uh, going to be a, a potential game changer. Don't know for sure, but it looks uh, to me as uh, that, that it, it could be. Why? Because the ability to have something that you could take off the shelf without having to harvest from uh, people potentially could do two things. First of all, it could allow you um, to salvage more individuals um, who might have advanced disease, who couldn't make it through uh, a harvest procedure for one reason or another. Additionally, though, an off-the-shelf product may also allow these products to be studied earlier on uh, in the disease process, um, potentially um, uh, for mopping up residual disease, which perhaps immune therapies might do better uh, than uh, for bulk disease, um, or they almost certainly probably do. Um, and so uh, I think that will be an exciting uh, development. The other advantage to these uh, genetically modified allogeneic uh, CAR T cells is that uh, because you're doing something for uh, a, a product that will ultimately be used to treat 50 to 100 different individuals uh, with your genetic modifications, um, uh, at least if you're using uh, uh, cells that are harvested um, from an individual as opposed to other ways of doing it, um, you can make more genetic modifications. And that also may open up uh, these uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells to better uh, addressing solid tumors, which has been a challenge to date. So I think that's a, an exciting place on, 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 on cell-based uh, uh, gene therapy. 
And then I think on the other end, you, you, you have already mentioned it, but I think seeing uh, genome editing uh, become a reality and potentially directly administered genome editors actually uh, be uh, something that are a possibility will be extremely exciting uh, because that really opens up a, a real world uh, of change. Uh, and it, it potentially is, is, is transformational because if you get in and fix the, uh, the genetic lesion, uh, you, you don't have to worry as much uh, about persistence of a, a construct. Um, and, and so this may also mean, uh, uh, you know, may, may be a way of, of getting over some of the challenges we've seen so in gene therapy. So I, again, those two areas, uh, very exciting. Whether those will hit or whether it'll be something else, you never know. Uh, but um, it, it, it's certainly just, those are just examples of the great excitement and enthusiasm um, for where things might go in this field. For sure, for sure. Certainly no promises, but we're all very cautiously optimistic. Makes perfect sense. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about one of the most broadly covered topics on cell and gene, which is manufacturing. And, you know, CMC as well as capacity in general remains, it, it quite stymies cell and gene, the space quite a bit. So what is your recommendation to companies and their engagement with the FDA to make making manufacturing more streamlined, cost-effective, all of those things? What, what, would, what would you say to, um, to the companies and their engagement with you? Yeah, I, I, think, I think in terms of manufacturing, I would come in early and uh, come in uh, planning for success. Um, obviously, you have to leverage when you make your investments into, uh, into your manufacturing process. But I think um, it's important to have conversations about development of the manufacturing process early on. I would also encourage companies who are thinking about going multinational to take advantage of the fact that there is a parallel advice process that can involve um, the U.S. Uh, EMA and PDMA, so you can get, uh, you know, US, Europe, and Japan, uh, and, and get that input all at once on your manufacturing process so that you can, with one uh, essentially fell swoop, try to satisfy uh, the different jurisdictions uh, and not have to reinvent things when you go from one place to another. Um, so again, communication here, it's kind of a theme of the day, perhaps um, uh, early. Um, and uh, really would better to be transparent with any uh, challenges um, uh, up front um, uh, and uh, also understand that um, when we give advice about CMC issues, um, you know, it's because we see an overview of things that perhaps one company, any one company doesn't see. Uh, and so, Sometimes I think uh, we get a little bit challenged on some of the advice we give. Feel free to challenge us. It's true. <laughs> Please do challenge us. But uh, sometimes the reason why uh, we give certain advice is because uh, we have the experience from looking at a broad portfolio of gene therapies that anyone, uh, anyone sponsor just can't see. And we can't tell you why we know what we know because we can't disclose the sure. contents of a uh, of of someone else's investigation new drug application to a different uh, sponsor um, uh, uh, without express permission. So, um, but we can use the experience we've gained. Sure. Uh, quick question for you. Uh, and I, whenever I talk to my guests on the podcast about manufacturing, and everyone always says starting early. But I would love to hear from you specifically, the expert. When you say early. What do you mean? When do you mean? When do I mean? I would say that uh, as you are uh, as you are moving. So, so if you've not made any gene therapy to doses to actually treat humans, uh, that might be a good time. Or if you've made gene therapy doses to treat a handful of humans, um, but are now scaling up to treat uh, more. Those are the times to do this. The time probably not to do this uh, is when you're in roller bottle culture, um, making you know doses for 20 or 30 people 
and then uh, decide, well, maybe we should now go to tanks uh, later on, uh, because by then you really, I mean, you may have to come in at that time, but it's probably better to have a discussion early on because there are probably some ways of scaling up that are easier than others. And it, it may be worthwhile having that discussion of, well, we're gonna study this in 20 people, and then we think that we're gonna scale up to need 40 doses a year. That would give us very different, you get very different feedback if that was your plan, rather than, oh, we're gonna study this in 20 people per year, but ultimately we wanna use it in a thousand people per year. Yeah. So you, you, I think that's, that's important to do. And, and I think actually for the field, that goes to another issue um, that I'm, I just, we, we really need to push forward manufacturing. And I think for that small manufacturer, um, we really, it, I, I would in, in the perfect world would love to see us get to a place where um, we could see just as there are closed devices that are useful for the manufacture of chimeric antigen receptor T cells in a semi-automated fashion, um, uh, it would be lovely to see us get to a place where for, um, at least for the purification process, but possibly for the entire manufacturing process um, uh, for uh, gene therapies like adeno-associated virus vector gene therapies that you could uh, have a, an automated process. In other words, a device that would, a uh, machine that would make these um, and would take away a lot of the variability that we're currently seeing. Again, these small batches um, many of the indications of gene therapy are for small batch gene therapy, um, and having something like this uh, could be a real game changer. So um, that's on my wish list for Christmas this year. Okay, good. I hope you get it. Uh, okay, just a few more questions. So, so cut to five years from now. In, in you mentioned in a perfect world, in a perfect world, what will have realistically improved in the in cell and gene therapy? So I think hopefully, realistically, um, we will see more reliable manufacturing. I think that will hopefully come from uh, better experience, sharing of experience, uh, and maturation uh, of the field. Um, I think we'll also hopefully see us at a place where we are leveraging what we knew, know about a given vector platform in order to be able to essentially move much more facilely uh, from one product to the next. In other words, we'll characterize uh, a gene therapy vector with a given insert uh, and uh, be able to move to that same vector uh, with a different, uh, uh, slightly different uh, or modestly different insert very easily uh, so that we don't have to do all of the rework every time. Uh, and that will hopefully allow us to move uh, forward by, uh, you know, some significant, I would love to see, you know, uh, uh, by a significant number uh, of uh, new approvals per year, um, doubling, trebling, uh, or further, uh, because um, of the ability to move from uh, product to product. So I think that will allow us to start to see gene therapies being, uh, you know, more widely used. And we might, uh, you know, in the five, you know, peaking over the five to 10 year horizon, start to see gene therapies uh, for somewhat more common diseases as opposed for uh, very rare diseases. Yeah, sure. Uh, when it comes to engaging with CBER, what advice do you have for selling gene the podcast listeners as they embark upon 2023? Yeah, I, I think 2023 is going to be a transitional year for us where we are trying to improve our business processes, uh, improve our communication and staff up. Um, and I would really in encourage people, feel free to communicate early and often. Um, uh, uh, please try to be a little patient with us as we staff up. Um, but that said, um, uh, I think we really look forward to engaging here um, uh, because this is really a very exciting time uh, and we'll look forward to, uh, to working together. Look out for um, uh, uh, potential uh, meetings, workshops, uh, and pilot programs that we hope to um, uh, have coming out uh, possibly in the second half of the year as we 
kind of come out of the initial stages of our reorganization. Absolutely. It sounds like a really exciting time for CBER and anyone who works with the organization. So that's great. Um, we've reached the formal end of our podcast. And at the end of uh, my every episode, my listeners know I like to ask a question of my guests to get to know who they are when they're not in the office of the lab. Uh, and so my questions for you are, what does Dr. Peter Marks do for fun? What what can we find Dr. Peter Marks doing on his off days? Uh, so probably my greatest passion is I love sailing. Uh, and oh. uh, it's a little cool for sailing right now. Um, uh, but uh, I, I absolutely uh, find that uh, it's one of the things that uh, just makes me, uh, 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 my blood pressure go down and uh, just feel so good doing so. Uh, that that's what you could find me on a weekend day during the summer. In the winter, you'd probably see me uh, 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 working on my boat. So <laughs> that's still that's also very enjoyable. That's amazing. That's what a what a fun passion. And uh, you know, I I suppose now you're starting in on the time of when you're working on the boat. That's exactly right. <laughs> time to scrape some paint and uh, get things ready for next season. <laughs> Good. Uh, my last question for you is: you know, you're asked questions like, you know, from people like me all the time, you know, from colleagues and journalists and patients and biotechs and you name it. And so when it comes to the cell and gene space, what do you wish people would ask you? And what would your response be to that question? Uh, I, I think um, someone might ask me, what's, what is your true interest in this? What, what really um, keeps you um, at FDA uh, and so interested in this field. Um, and I think I'd answer that question by saying that um, it's an area of such tremendous potential, but it will only um, see its realization if we hold it to rigorous scientific principles uh, and if we hold ourselves to making sure that what we do, uh, we do carefully, um, so that the products that ultimately emerge are, are safe, effective, and they bring a great deal of value uh, to those in medical needs. So that's what keeps me um, uh, going in this field. And I, I think it's actually what's shared by a lot of others um, uh, who are uh, trying to develop products in this space. So I, I think that's, that's to me, a I guess the question I'd ask <laughs> and answer. <laughs> well, good, good. And, and thank you for that thoughtful response because we're, everyone listening to this pod podcast and myself included are very, very thankful you're the one leading CBER both now and into the future. So that's great. All right, listeners, that wraps up this podcast, this episode, excuse me, of Cell and Gene, the podcast featuring Dr. Peter Marks. Dr. Marks, thank you so much for your generosity and your time and your willingness to share your insight with us. This was, a, this was great. Thank you so much for having me today. Absolutely. All right, listeners, be sure to visit CellandGene.com, register for our e-newsletter, e and tell your colleagues to subscribe to Cell and Gene, the podcast as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you soon.